So, of course, we're going to continue in the book of Isaiah. We're going to be in the 31st chapter today, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 9. Um, And the title of today's lesson, if you've had an opportunity to look at it, or if you've looked in your uh, text today, uh, is God Protects. And when we think about the protection that God provides, God provides us really unlimited protection. But the protection that God provides for us requires what? On our behalf. Faith, that's right. That's the key word. If you think back a few weeks ago, we talked a lot about that with King Ahaz and and the nation of Judah. And we're going to continue with a similar trend today, although there's a new king in place. Um, But God is able to protect his people from from their enemies. And we see this concept play out throughout Scripture with the Israelites. We also see it play out in the New Testament church as God provides protection over and over again for those who put their faith in Jesus Christ. But God is willing. He's willing and He's able. If you think back, we talked about the sovereignty of God a few weeks ago. And it's really been an overarching theme through all of our lessons, the sovereignty of God. And we talked about the sovereignty of God, about God being all-powerful, all-knowing. He knows all things. He's in control of all things. I think we even talked about Him being the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we have to focus on that and take our confidence. But really, we do have to have a deep faith in Jesus Christ and in God to experience His protection. We have three sections today that we're going to go through, and you can see those on the screen. And Jeff and I are going to bounce back and forth and go through those. It's nice to have Jeff back with me. I think back all the way to March when we started doing this, right, and how it was just so awkward standing in front of an iPhone and a camera and us working together through these lessons. But it's really been a great experience, and I hope people have enjoyed it, and I hope we've been able to provide something and I appreciate all the other teachers that have been willing to do that because it is a little bit unique the way we've been doing things but it's so like anything else we're doing in society today it's very unique but the three sections are false hope true faithfulness and repentance demonstrated and we're going to go through those here in just a minute but as we get into today's lesson I want to provide a little background so you know exactly where we are So if you remember the last time that I taught, we uh, were talking about King Ahaz. And what was King Ahaz's problem? What was the problem with King Ahaz? He was a king of the southern kingdom of Judah, of course of Judah, and and he had a problem. What was his problem? Well, that's one of his problems, (laughs) right? But that wasn't the problem we talked about in that lesson, okay? (laughs) That's right, he trusted in the wrong thing. And instead of Uh, placing his faith in God, he decided to uh, form a coalition with the Assyrian army, a very violent army. Um, And he didn't partner with the northern coalition, but soon the Assyrians took over and overtook the northern coalition, if we recall. And now the Assyrians are at a point of where they're encroaching in upon Judah, right? Now we have a new king. We have a king that's Hezekiah, and actually Hezekiah is a king that was put into place by the Assyrians. How ironic is that? But we see now that Judah still has a problem in King Hezekiah because they're afraid of the Assyrians. So now they're going to decide to partner with the Egyptians. Why is that problematic? (laughs) That's right. Think about the book of Exodus. I mean, God had provided a way out for the Israelites, right? They crossed the Jordan, right? They crossed the Red Sea, and, and the chariots were overtaken by water. You remember how it was parted, and they were able to escape the Egyptians in Pharaoh's rule? So fast forward now, we see oppression coming in on Judah and the Israelites, the remnant, and we decide to partner back with the Egyptians. How short our memory may be, right? That's very indicative of us today, but you see that, Jeff pointed out uh, this morning when we were having some discussions about the lesson that Hezekiah really was put in place by the Assyrians who they placed their faith in when they rebelled against God and now they're going back to putting their faith in the Egyptians who God had previously rescued them. So huge problem here with uh, their way of life and their trust and where they're putting their faith. But Jeff's going to lead us through the first section. The first section is titled False Hope, and uh, I'm going to let him read the verses, and uh, we'll go through the first section. All right. Uh, it's good to be with everybody this morning. <clears throat> my, my apologies for my, my <laughs> departure there in the month of September, and Stephen was very kind to remind me that I left him hanging in September yeah. on his own, so he pointed that out. Uh, one thing to add to the background, <clears throat> there's always unintended consequences if you think about decisions that we make. There's the, the ideas that you know you're walking into, and there's the things that you don't think about. And the, 
the, the Judeans were thinking about saving their backsides at the current time. And so to do that, they, as Jonathan mentioned, they went with the Assyrians. Well, to do that was, was a great move on their part as far as militarily because the Assyrians were the strong ones in the area. But because of the puppet king, Hezekiah, the Assyrians put in, they became kind of tied, tied in, and they had to pay tributes every year. And tributes, you know, when, when nations start paying tributes to other nations, it does nothing but weaken the nation as a whole. And so the, the Judeans were setting themselves up for, you know, the Assyrians to weaken them over time financially, which in turn would make them easier for them to pick off. So they, they were kind of setting themselves up for a big issue. And as Jonathan, you know, so, so well put, you know, the next option to turn to was the Egyptians. And so if you'll join me here in verses 1 through 3, uh, <clears throat> Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help, who rely on horses, who trust in the multitude of their chariots and in the great strength of their horsemen, but do not look to the Holy One of Israel or seek help from the Lord. Yet he too is wise and can bring disaster. He does not take back his words. He will rise up against that wicked nation, against those who help evildoers. And in verse 3 here, But the Egyptians are mere mortals and not God. Their horses are flesh and not spirit. When the Lord stretches out his hand, those who help will stumble, and those who are, uh, who are helped will fall. All will perish together. And so we, you know, the title of this section is certainly false hope. And as we, we kind of look at the picture we're, we're seeing to, anytime the, the scripture leads into with the word woe is not going to turn out well for those that are involved in this particular passage. Uh, and we see that here. And, you know, the Judeans have made a, a fatal error. Um, they have decided to turn, you know, from the one that has rescued them, from the one that has provided continually, and they're turning to, to a mortal power. Um, you know, they're, they're looking to Egypt, and, and Egypt was, was kind of the, 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 the big sin at the time was for them to, to go back that direction. Um, some of the material kind of referred to it as, you know, you know, a domestic violence situation where, you know, one spouse got out, and then they decided to go back. You know, the, the Israelites going back to, you know, Egypt would be, you know, similar, just something to kind of, you know, to kind of compare to there. <clears throat> but, but why do you think, why do you think it was so tempting for them to go to Egypt? And I asked lots of questions, so. What did Egypt have that most armies didn't? Chariots, Chariots horses, horsemen. Let's think, you know, let's think about how, you know, a lot of you, you know, quite a few of you have served in the military. War has changed over time. And if you think about war now and, and the, the, the missiles we have and the, the, you know, the nuclear weaponry and, and all that is, is, you know, is one thing. Let's think back to how they fought here. And uh, if a military was strong enough to have chariots and horsemen and, and horses, that was something that would put them above and beyond you know, the, their, their foes and who they're fighting. And so for the Judeans, it made, you know, in their mind, you know, from, a, from a, a mortal standpoint, it made sense to go to Egypt because Egypt had the chariots. Egypt, Egypt had the horsemen. They had those resources, which would have given them a leg up against the Assyrians. <clears throat> and in their great strength of their horsemen, but do not, over, do not look to the Holy One of, uh, of Israel or seek help from the Lord. So Isaiah, you know, in verse 1 here, he is, you know, kind of reprimanding them. You know, hey, listen, you know, if you're going to Egypt and you're not going to God first, woe to you. You know, be prepared. It's fixing to, you know, what's fixing to happen is not going to go well. And then we see in verses 2 and 3, you know, he starts in 2, yet he too is wise and can bring disaster. And, we, you know, I, I kind of laughed when I read, you know, 2 and t being T-O-O. -O. You know, Isaiah threw a little bit of sarcasm in here, a little bit of, you know, prophetic sarcasm on, on things. Um, which I, I appreciate as I'm reading things or watching TV. A little sarcasm kind of keeps it light. But, you know, he's saying you think you're wise. You think you're making the right decision by going with what you think is the military power in the area. But you're completely turning your back from the one power that has saved you from everything you've ever encountered and has been there nonstop. <clears throat> but he reminds them. He does not take back his words, you know, and what scripture has told him was do not, <laughs> absolutely do not go back to Egypt. Uh, you, can, you can find that in Deuteronomy 17, 14 through 20, uh, if you want to, you know, kind of dig back a little further. And, you know, scripture was very clear that, you know, they were not to go back to Egypt. He will rise up against that wicked nation, you know, that wicked nation being Judah, against those who help evildoers, and that's, you know, that's, e that's Egypt in this point. 
But the Egyptians are mere mortals and not God. Their horses are flesh and not spirit. And when the Lord stretches out his hand, those who help will stumble. Those who are helped will fall. All will perish together. Again, the Lord's making it very clear. Or Isaiah's making it very clear here in, in this you know, uh, prophecy and in, in the word here that you know, there's a difference between worldly wisdom and godly wisdom. You know, in their in their minds, the worldly wisdom thing to do was to to protect what they could protect and to go with what they thought was the power at the time. You know, and and a lot of times, I mean, we get ourselves in those same situations where we want to look to worldly wisdom instead of stepping back and saying, "All right, God, how do you want this to go? You know, show me your plan. You know, please guide me in this direction." Um, and it's you know, I think to an extent, we need a little bit of both. You know, I think God provides that wisdom. You know, we ask for it. He provides it, you know, in, in abundance of what we need. You know, but we, he also expects us to turn to him. And he expects us to rely on him, you know, in every situation. Um, you know, with <laughs> the, the, the Judeans were kind of, you know, they're almost fence riding, if you know that old expression. Uh, and you know what will happen when you, you, know, you, you ride the fence. You end up getting splinters in your backside. And, you know, with, with the Lord, there is no fence riding. You're either on his side or you're not. It's, it's fairly simple. Uh, there's not a lot of things that are black and white, but, but this is one of those areas. And he, he also pointed out, too, in, in this section, and then we'll kind of hit the, the points here. You know, when you think of mortals versus, you know, God, mortals are finite. We have a limited, you know, with Greg's you know, request from Miss Eleanor's family, we have a limited number of years that, that, you know, God allows us to be on this earth. You know, we're, we, we will expire. And it's not a bad thing, but it's just how it is. You know, versus an, an unlimited or an eternal God that is that is all present at all times, and, and involved in everything and is aware of everything. So, there was a lot of false hope that the Judeans were, were working with here, um, and and as we see, they've kind of set themselves up, you know, for some big issues. A uh, couple of the points here, I think Jonathan's got on the screen. You know, Isaiah called out to Hezekiah. You know, he he called him out for turning to Egypt. Um, you know, they wanted the Assyrians to help. They set themselves up for the Assyrians to come in and take them over. And then it's, oh, no, we got to do something else. Let's go to the Egyptians. And, you know, and then Isaiah, on top of that, you know, reminded, the king, reminded the king that God is not limited in his power. You know, kings are limited. Presidents are limited. You know, people, governors are limited. Everyone, is, we're all limited. God is not. And, and, and it's so easy to forget that, you know, in, you know this point in time. So uh, this, you know, we'll turn it back over to Jonathan here for section number two. And so that, that was a great segue that Jeff just gave us speaking about God. And, and here we're going to see a descriptor in verses 4 and 5 of God. And we're going to see uh, that He's the epitome of true faithfulness. I mean, He really is. He is the epitome of true faithfulness. And you can see on the screen, I'll just go through these points before we read the scripture, that Isaiah explained that God would remain faithful even when His people, people were unfaithful. And God never will leave nor forsake us. And I think that's something for us to put our, to stake our claim upon, right? And even though when this world tells us many different things, God will never leave us or forsake us. That's one of the great promises in the Bible. And we see that despite Judah's disobedience, the Lord was gracious to protect his people and offer protection. So let's read verses 4 and 5. Of course, this section is titled Truth, Faithfulness. Uh, and then let's see what we can pull out of this scripture here uh, as we look at it more closely. This is what the Lord says to me, as a lion growls a great lion over its prey, and through a whole band of shepherds is called together against it, it is not frightened by their shouts or disturbed by their clamor. So the Lord Almighty will come down to do battle on Mount Zion and on its heights. Like birds hovering overhead, the Lord Almighty will shield Jerusalem. He will shield and deliver it. He will pass over and he will rescue you know, the description that we see here is in stark contrast to what we read in the first few verses. We see a descriptor of, of God. Uh, we see a descriptor of His unfailing mercy and His willingness to protect. And we need to keep a few things in mind as we go through the Scripture. First, when God judges, and we see judgment all through Scripture. And we see judgment throughout Scripture. We see it in the world today. But God does not abandon. God does not abandon. In fact, God's judgment is always an attempt to do what? What is God's judgment? It's always an attempt to do what? With the Israelites in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, we see it throughout Scripture and here today in the world. God's judgment is always an attempt to do what? Bring to bring us back. 
to draw us closer to Him and put us in a right relationship with Him. Also, God's deliverance can serve this same purpose, right? I mean, you think about the many things that you've dealt with in your life, and we think about the many things that the Israelites dealt with throughout history. When God provided a way out and provided deliverance, it should also serve this same purpose, to help them to reunite into a closer, more right relationship with God and a more intimate relationship. That's very applicable to us today. God's judgment brings us back, but God's deliverance and protection should also draw us closer to Him. But we see two examples here in Scripture. What are the two examples we see? The lion and the bird, the and the bird right? And so the example of the lion, I thought about uh, the song that we hear frequently, you know, my God is a lion, right? And it speaks about my God being a lion. He's roaring over Judah. And we see the description here in verses 4 and 5. The key point here is the lion represents who? God Almighty. The lion is a representative of God Almighty. Thus no man can overcome. No man, no nation, no power here in this world can overcome our God. All human forces can work in tandem, can work in the most powerful and most creative ways, the most unique ways, the most innate ways, the most educated ways, but they can never overtake our God. And we see that. We see the description here of the shepherd that is clamoring and calling. You think about that. Uh, an example, when our children were young, we went to the zoo. And of course, I wouldn't say it was the most enjoyable trip I've ever been on. I feel like I walked 15 miles and I chase kids. And of course, they wanted to go from one, you know, uh, exhibit to the next. And of course, there were certain things that I wanted to do. And of course, we didn't get to do those things. That's being a parent, right, with kids. But I do remember the lion. Have you ever heard a lion? We got close to the lion and the lion actually roared. Have you ever heard a lion roar? I mean, have you, even if you've heard it on TV, I mean, just the sheer power. Right? We would be powerless about, around an animal of such magnitude and of God's creation. I think about Jeff and Stephen. They were having some discussions about different animals prior to um, our lesson today and just talking about the power of some of these massive animals. But we know that the lion's referred to as the king of the jungle, right? He is, he is all-powerful, and that is a representative of God. He speaks, too, about Mount Zion is held up. And Mount Zion is the primary... Uh, point of contact for God's protection, and I think Archie did a great job expanding upon that last week. Uh, but then the second we see, we see the mother bird here. And the description of the mother bird is what? What does it say about the bird? It's going to do what? Over the people. It's going to hover over the people to provide protection. It's not true of God today, God hovering over us, providing protection, looking down. Upon us. I think about Jesus Christ. It says Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Where is he at? He's at the right hand of the Father. He's at the right hand of the Father and he's interceding for us on our behalf. Right? He is in control of all things. And the mother bird, so we also see the Lord Almighty being referred to as a mother bird that provides a shield of protection from above. You know, the bird would show superior power over any who tried to come in and provide an attack. You know, I think about the times that a mother bird is the most sensitive would be when someone tries to get around what? The nest. And what's in the nest? The baby birds, right? And I think we could spend a little time thinking about the baby birds here because we, we understand that we are representative of the baby birds here, right? That we are God's people and God's going to care for us. But think about the baby birds in the nest. And, and so what are some characteristics of the baby birds in the nest? If you, they're dependent. That's a great word, right? And when they're first born, they're blind, right? They're blind. They can't see. And then the bird goes out and gets what? Gets the food, of course, description. They eat it. They regurgitate it. And then they put it in a form that the baby can eat for nourishment, right? So think about that. Although that's a, a description we may not want to spend a lot of time thinking about, but the mother bird is essential to the sustenance of the baby bird. Especially when it's blind, they can't care for themselves. Beth used a great description. They're dependent. Now, how does that relate to us as people, as a nation, right? We're dependent. There's very little things that we're in control of. Although we like to act like we're in control of many things, and sometimes we get very private very arrogant about things at 
a country and as a people group and as individuals. There are very few things that we're in control of. So we need the mother bird. We need the protection. We need the provisions. We see in Matthew 23, 37, and we see that this is uh, almost parallel. It says, Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, who kill the prophets and stone those who sent you. How often I have longed to gather your children together as hens gather her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. You think there's a description of the hen gathering the for the purpose of providing protection and provision. So God will shield and deliver. God will pass over and rescue. He will pass over and provide protection over the remnant, but it requires faith on the behalf of the believer. And in this case, it required faith on the behalf of the Israelite. Jeff. All right. <clears throat> so we're going uh, to this last section here, for, uh, repentance demonstrated, verses 6 through 9. And we're in, in kind of two here, six and seven and eight and nine, um, and kind of read them and then go through them. <clears throat> in verse six, return to your lights to the one you have so greatly revolted against. For in that day, every one of you reject the idols of silver and gold your sinful hands have made. <clears throat> he's he is not not you know um, mincing words here. He's he's being very clear, you know, with the Israelites and the direction that they have turned. And when you think about being a greatly is a revolt ever something that just happens spontaneously? If you really think through, if you think through history, do revolts happen spontaneously, or is that is that a decision that people made to be a part of? Yeah, and and that's what we're seeing here. It's an intentional action. If you decide to revolt against something, you've thought about it. It's not a it's not a spur of the moment kind of decision. So we're seeing here, he's calling them out, you know, and, and telling them what they need to do. You know, return you Israelite to the one you have so greatly. It against. They had, you know, specifically and purposefully, intentionally, turned from God and, and turned into their own way and to, to go things the direction they wanted to go. You mentioned control and having control. And if you really boil down idolatry, what does it come down to? It comes down to control. It comes down to us feeling like or having thinking that we have something in our hands, something that we can have control over, or having control over the uncontrollable. And that doesn't happen. We, you know, we can't control God, so in turn, we think we want, we can do it on our own. Yeah, I can handle the situation like this. No, not a problem. But we also, thankfully, have a loving Father that, while He doesn't mind reprimanding us, you know, that, that reprimand, judgment is only for. I think you mentioned a while ago to restore us, is to redeem us, is to remind us where we've misstepped, and we see that idolatry, it, it can, it can be anything. You know, we often talk about power. We talk about money, job, you know, things that can allow to take precedent in our lives, you know, above the relationship with God. And, it, and it's easy to do, you know, I mean, and, and just, uh, it takes, a, it takes a purposeful, you know, decision, you know, to set that time apart. And about, we always were told, that, you know, through God and everything, and, and I have been growing up, but, you know, you have time for what you have time for. I always hear, oh, I'm just too busy, I'm too busy. you have time, you time for what's important you know and if you don't think you know just think how you plan your day you know the things that are priorities you have time for um and we're, we're in, in israel you know repent and they turn to god you know turn back and we've seen that multiple times through history how they'll swap off and then come back um and then you know we get into verse eight and nine here you know, Assyria will fall by no, no human sword a sword not of mortals devour them they will flee before the sword and they Men will be put into forced labor. Their stronghold will fall because of terror. At the sight of the battle standard, their command will pay, declares the Lord, whose fire is in Zion, whose furnace is in Jerusalem. So, again, to, to put it in, in perspective here, Assyria was the dominant army you know, in the area of northern Israel, you know, Judea, southern Israel here. They were the dominant force that everyone was terrified of. Um, and, you know, but God makes it very clear that. It his people will, will trust in him, will rely on him to protect them, that, you know, Assyria is not going to fall by a human sword. There is no army that's going to take them out. Yet, you know, they uh, will, you know, flee before the sword. Uh, a sword not of mortals will devour them. And, you know, just to highlight 2 Kings 19, uh, verse 35 here, you know, that night the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. 
when the people got up the next morning, that there were all the dead bodies. Think about that. If his people would have just turned to him initially, they wouldn't have had to go through all this you know, fun that they've decided to go through. God still took care of them. And is there any reason why the Assyrians wouldn't think oh, that's, that, was, that was God? You, know, you go to bed and everything's fine, and you wake up the next morning and 185,000 of your army are dead. And if that doesn't strike fear into you, there's nothing going to. Um, and, and so, and this, that's not just going to rattle the Syrians, that's going to rattle the Jews too. That's going to, you know, those that feel like they, they had control are going to be reminded very quickly that they have no control. <clears throat> and then we get into the last part here, you know, in the image of the fire, so, uh, whose fire is in Zion, whose furnace is in Jerusalem. Where, do, where have we seen fire previously in Scripture? This is not a, this is not a once and done kind of thing. Where have we seen this before? Yeah. Yep. What else? Burning bush. What about the Israelites? Pillar of fire, left. You know, by day and or smoke by day and fire by night. You know, throughout throughout the the scripture here, we've seen that fire was an image of God's presence and presence with them. Um, and, and every one of these examples are, are spot on, you know, and, and we think about Jerusalem being the furnace, you know, where is the furnace? What would mean, what does that come to mind? When you think about the furnace, how does it radiate from that? The heat, that's the heat that fire, that, that heats the house, right? You know, he's saying the fire, the furnace is in Jerusalem. How would it be in Jerusalem? <laughs> Central place. That's where God chose to dwell amongst his people. He didn't have to. He wasn't obligated to. He to come down and dwell with his people in Jerusalem. Now, does that mean they get, they get a free pass? Absolutely not. But when Jerusalem gets judged and Jerusalem turns back, you see the whole Israelite nation also turning back to God. You know, and as hard as it is to deal with sometimes, and y'all that had kids, I mean, you didn't, you didn't spank your kids you know, because it was fun. Or because, uh, well, kids may have gotten spanked because it was fun. For the most part, you know, you did it to reprimand them. You know, you did it to teach them a lesson, you know, to, to show an error in a way. And judge, you know, also that redemption that came after it when there was an understanding of I did something wrong. You know, so Jonathan mentioned, you know, judgment, judgment leads to redemption, and redemption leads to that restoration. And that's what, that's what God's looking for. He wants us close to him. And if not, it's not because he went anywhere. It's because we chose to take a deep uh, and And so that's we're seeing all this kind of wrapped into how the how the Judeans chose to deal there with with the, within the the geography of the nations there uh, and, and power struggles. Uh, a couple of key points here on, on this one: you know, Isaiah challenged the people to turn back to God. I'd say that challenge still exists to us. You know, we need to remember to turn back to God. We need you know we need to be praying that this country will continue to turn back to God. You know, and turn back to Him meant removing idols and you're seeing this, all things that are that are taking your time away, or need to be pulled away. Um, and then finally, God would also defeat his enemies. And his enemies are anybody that's his people. And I think we've seen that over time with, with, um, with Israel, you know, through history, from this point in history, current history. Israel is protected. <laughs> whether they think about it or whether the world thinks about it, Israel is protected by a bigger power than any of the other superpowers in the world. So a lot to a lot to kind of you know sort and I think Jonathan's got some some yeah well so in conclusion you can see on the screen there's a couple of uh, key points or summary statements from today's lesson and a couple of things I want to add to this but trusting in human power rather than God's power will ultimately lead to defeat uh, and uh, feeling self sufficient and putting faith in humans of course is going to lead to defeat God remains faithful even when we are not. That's, you know, in the modern world, we have to, you know, really get to that point where we recognize that God is always going to be faithful, but we have to submit to his authority. And trusting in God will ultimately lead to victory. I, I think back to, you know, Jeff, as he's talking about these many nations, and one thing that came to my mind was the poly, polytheistic way of life that they had. They served multiple gods. Idols were something they always created. Do we create idols today? I mean, 
create idols today? It may not be a golden calf, but do we create idols today here in America? And, and if we do, we need to be very careful of that uh, because we are to be totally dependent on God. And that's when we're in the closest, most right relationship with Him. But you know, there's uh, a question in our text that really there's two things I want to close with. And one, it says, do you ever have trouble believing that God's in control of the events of the modern world? I mean, is it not tough when you get up every morning and you see just numerous things going on that just makes you question? But how do we know God's in control? How do we know? The Bible. The Bible. I mean, we have to take confidence. We can't take confidence in our intuition and the things that the media tells us or the world tells us or things that we see every day because we're inundated with all of those, all of those different uh, sources. But we have know that God is in control even in the modern day world because the Bible says so. And you know the thing I want to finish with and, and you know we see uh, great examples of disobedience uh, throughout uh, the book of Isaiah uh, and the Israel people and the nation of Judah. One question we constantly ask in our class I guess back February, March when we were together you know typically the source of disobedience is fear right? The source for the Israelites and their disobedience was fear, fear of the invasion. And so the reality is, the question we frequently ask is, what are you afraid of in your personal life that prevents disobedience, or that pre prevents obedience, excuse me. So what are you afraid of that prevents obedience? So I appreciate you joining us today.